We love the college football conversation with Zach Smith from Menace to Sports. You got to check out his podcast. It posts every day on your favorite audio platform. Again, Zach Smith at uh, Menace to Sports. Zach, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you? Doing great. And uh, I think I've got some interesting uh, conversation for you. Can't wait to get your take on a few items. One that came down this week. Okay, J.J. McCarthy's on a podcast. Of course, Michigan quarterback who accounted for all of 12 yards in Michigan's win against Ohio State. So we'll put that into context. Yeah. To quote J.J. this week, that's all we know is beating Ohio State right now, dot, dot, dot. So we're going to keep that going, end quote. How much do you take from that? Do you think it's true trash talking? Do you think it's out of bounds? What do you think it is? I mean, you know, I think it's it's kind of the new age of media, right? You go on a podcast, you're kind of in a secluded space until someone hears it and blows it up. And then all of a sudden, you know, you you gave an interview where you said that when I'm sure he was probably just thought he was talking to a guy on a podcast. And then that was that. It was just a conversation. But I think it's, you know, <clears throat> my initial reaction is as a football coach, if I had a kid that did that, that was a backup quarterback, I would pull him in my office. We'd have a long conversation about how you better go do something on the field before you start running your mouth. I mean, and, and even then, Show some class, act like you've been there before, and you don't need to talk about it. Let your play speak for itself, but especially a backup. I mean, just a bad look overall, but I get it, right? They've had that monkey on their back for so long that now they got it off and they don't know how to act, right? They're just, they're, they're running their victory laps and they just can't stop. And, you know, so that's the coach inside of me, but the other side of it is, I think it's great. It's great for the rivalry, right? It's great for, it's great on a bigger picture. It's not great for Ohio state fans and Buckeye nation. They hate it. They're miserable right now, but you know, out, if you step outside of the rivalry, it's, it reinvigorated it. It gave it energy again. And so I'm here for it. And it's going to be a fun, even more fun game than we've had the last decade come the end of November because of, because of what has happened the last, whatever, four months. We've seen a lot worse trash talking. So I don't oh, yeah. think it was like disrespectful out of bounds. I do call exception to, we don't know what it's like to lose to Ohio State. Okay, you're a freshman. You yeah. can speak to your your freshman buddies. Yeah, you guys are one and oh, but right. there's a whole lot of guys in that locker room that know what it's like to lose to Ohio State once or twice or three times. Yeah, and, and you know what? He, he also he individually doesn't know what it's like to beat Ohio State because he had nothing to do with it. I mean, he, it, that's my biggest thing. If you let's say you go out there kind of like uh, our I remember our defense, and I think it was what 2016 when we went to Oklahoma and our defense was called a basic defense and they didn't do any talking. They just went on the field, shut down Baker Mayfield. And after the game, all they did was hold the signs up that said basic defense, right? That's it. They didn't, and they, but they waited to let their play dictate kind of who they were. And then they just had fun with it. There's a big difference here. What I was surprised with Zach is that Ryan day posted this in the facility. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, I, it's, I was a little surprised by that, by him making something big out of it yeah see it's it's mickey marotti it's not ryan i mean not that ryan didn't okay. know about it but mickey marotti's yep. been doing that his whole career a way to kind of piss off the team motivate the team train them with an edge i mean going back to you you name a time we lost to clemson in 2013 that whole offseason we got to watch images of, of michigan state winning the big 10 clemson winning the orange bowl i mean it's all that offseason creating that chip on their shoulder going all the way back to uh <laughs> when, when when i was when we were at florida mickey marotti was there and we're going to play ohio state in the national championship game and it all started, I came back to Columbus uh, for, for the holidays. We got to go home for Christmas. I'm from Columbus. You know, I work at Florida, so it was a big conflict at, at, at the Christmas day. But I went to the mall to do last-minute Christmas shopping, and they were selling 2006 Ohio State National Champions footballs. And the game had been – it was still two and a half weeks away. So I bought one and took it back to Florida and showed it to Urban and Mickey, and they went just – and then they went way overboard. Like that ball sat in the locker room so everyone could see it. And then they told me, just make up quotes. Doesn't even matter if it's real. Like Troy Troy Smith said, this defensive line is, is you know, nothing compared to Michigan's. We were just making up quotes, just trying to motivate players. So um, that's, that's what Mickey Marotti does now. He creates a chip on your shoulder, even if there's not one. Even if everyone just comes out and says, you're the best ever, he'll find a way – to find either someone that said something or he'll just make it up, completely fabricate it just to piss the team off. One of the more famous ones for Ohio State recently outside of the Michigan rivalry was after the loss to Clemson in the playoff in 2019. That score being posted, <laughs> Justin Fields in particular, yeah. made that a mission, which is kind of a different sort because 
who knows if you're going to play them again. Now, fate had it that they got to match up again, took yeah. care of business, and won in a three-touchdown blowout. There's no doubt. I mean, and that was... You know, it's 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 still even in that scenario, you're playing on player self-respect, right? Their desire to be great, their desire to win a championship, and just that embarrassing moment. Even if you don't play Clemson again, even if they didn't play them in 2020 in that playoff matchup, whoever they played, that feeling a year before of getting beaten in the semifinal would have resonated, right? It, 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 they would have still felt that, no matter who the opponent was. So he'll find a way every offseason. He always has. He always will. After we won the national championship, he found ways to to make that team still have a chip on their shoulder. And it's just it's 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 what he does great. If, if there's something Mickey Marotti is excellent at, it is team chemistry and 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 kind of get, having the heartbeat of the team in his hand, and then finding ways to poke and prod at that culture and make them make them go. You know, make them productive. So you're a believer in not necessarily being the the source of the bulletin board material but taking the bulletin board material motivating oh, yeah. the players because there's obviously as you know better than I do there's a there's a theory out there some football coaches basically hey these speeches are only so good as the first play of the game you get punched in the mouth and you need to to be in, incentivized by something else yeah I mean I, I like it I think it doesn't hurt right um I did it as a position coach I remember we lost to Virginia Tech that in 2014 that infamous game you know the national championship season and we got to play them week one in 2015 and you know I had Michael Thomas who was this great player and he was going against who was projected as the top corner in the country Kendall Fuller and so in my mind I'm like I have the best receiver in the country they have the best corner in the country I better figure out everything I can do to to push every button on this kid to make him play at a higher level. And I'm not, I'm not as big on pregame speeches. I think at that point, the work is done. I mean, you, you can kind of re refocus players, but you don't get somebody, you know, win one for the Gipper and, and the, you know, those old speeches where guys run through walls. I just, that's just not football nowadays, but I did. I mean, I put propaganda all over the facility, all over Michael Thomas's locker, our meeting room of Kendall Fuller, you know, just funny things, but, that you know, like the two thirds of the world is covered by water, the other third is covered by Kendall Fuller, stuff like that, you know. And then Kirk Herb Street gave out his Herbie Awards, preseason awards, and he named Kendall Fuller the the preseason whatever you want to call it Thorpe Award winner, the Herbie Award winner, right? And I I put that everywhere. And Mike, he was he told me two days before the game, he was like, Coach, if you do one more thing and mention that kid's name one more time, I might fight you. And so I was like, all right, it's working. So then of course I went even more overboard, and he got in the game and he was angry, like. Every route he had to win, he had to embarrass the kid, and he did embarrass him on a little stutter touchdown to the point where after the game, he started publicly calling out Kirk Herbstreet for no reason. Like, Kirk didn't do anything to him. He didn't say anything bad about Mike, but I had created this world where Kendall Fuller was the best and Mike wasn't good enough, and he felt like he had to prove it. So I think there's a lot of psychological things you can do with bulletin board material that's great. And what you just made the differentiation on makes total sense. If you're going to make a speech 15 seconds before they yeah. leave the locker room, hey, all the work's been put in. If they haven't worked hard enough to get yeah. themselves prepared for it, there's nothing you can do at that point. Sure, you want to give a good speech, but is it really going to matter versus motivation through the entire offseason, through the season yeah. to get them to work and prepare to get ready for that moment? No doubt. You're, you're, you're just, it's all a psychological game, right? Co coaching and motivating is all about psychology. And that's when the real work's done. That's when you really need to motivate them. And, and Urban used to say this all the time. And I believe this to my core. If a kid is going out in the Michigan game and needs you to pump them up, you're screwed. You're done. You're not going to win the game in that moment. Now on a, you know, a, a February mat drill at 545 in the morning, Eh, not, not a lot of kids are really motivated to go do that. So you got to provide them a little something to, to remind them why they're doing it, right? When you're in training camp and it's hard and you go to, you know, team drills and, you're, and, and your legs are tired, it's like, why do I have, why should I keep working so hard when I'm tired? I'm exhausted. Like, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You have to give them that extra edge, that extra motivation and reminder. Like, listen, here's why right? Create, create some psychological situation where they, they push a little harder and then that'll pay off in game day. And like, and, and once you get to game day, like I said, you might need to refocus them, remind a couple reminders to kind of hone in exactly what their job is and what they need to do. But as far as the rah, rah, like win one for the Gipper, I'm out on that. It, it, it doesn't, if they're not, up, if they're not ready to play the game, I mean, what are you talking about? You get 14 a year and you train 360 days a year. So we well, always love the uh, Cali Football Conversation with Zach Smith. Join him on Menace to Sports and uh, follow him on Twitter as well, 
at uh, Coach Zach Smith. Please hit the like button. That's all you need to do. Just hit the like button. Subscribe right here at the Voice of College Football. And again, on over to Menace to Sports on your favorite audio platform each and every day. Make it your go-to, again, for college football coverage and sports in general. All right. Um, we see these coaches. Uh, they live a nomadic lifestyle. You get a, a new job every couple of years. So for Michigan in particular, Josh Gaddis moves on to Miami as offensive coordinator and Mike McDonald back to the NFL with the Baltimore Ravens. Um when a top-notch offensive or defensive coordinator moves on, the thought from a nuts and bolts X is no, an O standpoint could be, okay, they've left you their scheme. You played it for a full year. You've got the tape. Right. you got the reps. Can't you just steal all the good stuff that they brought? Um, yeah. what, what's the balance between what was lost versus uh, what you could possibly maintain from, from that particular individual? Well, this, this kind of goes back to a, a company like an organizational chart of how you build your 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 organization, right? How you build your program. And if you look at Nick Saban and what they do, you know, they never really have to go outside and bring in some foreign coordinator. It's always a filter from underneath system, right? And I think that's the, the most successful and sustainable model. And when you do that, like you said, you can keep doing what you did because the guy was on staff doing it with the coordinator. And then you can always enhance. You can always grow. You can add a wrinkle here and there. Um, most of the time when you bring in outside coordinators, in my career at least, when I've seen it work best, it's because things weren't right on that side of the ball. And so it is almost like a blow it up and start over mentality. Like when Ed Warner and Tim Beck got pushed out at Ohio State, Ryan Day and Kevin Wilson come in. It was a blow it up, start over, and let's build one of the best offenses in the country. Jim Knowles gets hired at Ohio State. They certainly aren't watching what Kerry Combs did, right? He is bringing in a system. They're blowing it up and starting over. When you do that to a product that was successful, it's hard for the players to buy in because they just ran a system and were successful. And it's like, wait, why am I? Why are we doing a new system? Like we just were killing it in this other system. So it's a, it's a tough dynamic for a player to do that, and that's why I really believe in. And I think Nick Saban has it figured out. Right. He has this, this unbelievable system and it's just who's the coordinator doesn't matter if this guy leaves. We'll, I'll promote the next best assistant. You know, we'll, we'll make I make sure he does a great job. We bring in another great assistant coach and the, the machine just keeps churning out championships. Right. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see what they do because they were really successful on offense for the first time in a long time. So, you know, those players were bought in and then <clears throat> Josh Gaddis leaves and, and McDonald. And it's like the defensive coordinator leaves and now they're going to have two new coordinators. And it's like, I, I don't know how you don't run the same system with a couple enhancements and just to keep the players, you know, on board almost. So, Zach, it sounds like based on what you viewed uh, in your current seat, but also more so on a coaching staff is you've got and I'm going to name the name, the guy that gets tagged with being um a, a bit staunch in what he brought to the table. And that's Don Brown, the former Michigan defensive coordinator. You've seen those guys that sure they're smart football coaches. They teach well, they know a scheme. It's really good, but they're kind of bought in on that. And that's what they do. And regardless of what they see in front of them on the roster, they're going to run their system versus guys that sure they got their core values. They got their concepts that they believe in, but they also are able to assess the talent and say, we need to make some adjustments. I need to be able to fit my scheme to what the personnel dictates. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the key, right? And Don Brown was definitely a little old school, but I think he really gets a bad rap what he did at Michigan. I mean, you look at his defenses at Boston College before he came, I and mean, they were top five every year. And he comes into Michigan, and the guy forgot how to be a D coordinator, apparently. Um, I think I when, I when I watched Michigan in that kind of that tenure, it was really more about just a dysfunctional offense and an average special teams unit. And it's hard to play defense when you have that. I mean, you, it, it's a lot easier to be prolific on offense with a bad defense than it is to be great on defense with a horrible offense, if that makes sense. And he definitely was a little old school. He was a little stuck in his ways. He was a little stuck, like you said, in this scheme that you know was top five in the country every year at Boston College. He brings it to Michigan, probably <clears throat> should have tweaked it a little bit. But I think that was more Jim Harbaugh screwing up the offense and, and really not helping Don Brown with field position and sudden change and stuff like that, that, that really made the defense seem worse than it was. I always thought when he was there, that defense was tough. The offense was what you laughed at. Zach, tell me if this makes sense. 
when you observe uh, the score differentials, like in playoffs, conference championship games, big games, and I'm looking mm-hmm. at the Ohio State Michigan game in particular in 2018 and 19, mm-hmm. where on the surface you would say Ohio State's a top three to four team in the country. Michigan's more like a top 12 to 15 team. This shouldn't be a four touchdown game. Yeah. Same thing we've seen in the playoffs, where an LSU lines up against an Oklahoma where LSU is not beating t- average teams of the SEC by five touchdowns. They get to right. a playoff and they're drubbing Oklahoma by five touchdowns where it seems like does the intensity and the, um, the bigness of the game also amplify the talent gap. Absolutely. And then game game plans come into it, right? Um, those games are great examples. And, and, you know, some players really, rise to an occasion right and and that certainly happened in those rivalry games it happened another game kind of against ohio state's favor was the 2020 national championship game i mean that game plan they had two two what two first round corners uh they had a, a starting free safety an nfl's free safety i mean they had talent but the game plan was beautiful Devonte smith was unreal mac jones couldn't throw a bad ball like those kids just rose to the occasion and the game plan was just i mean it was a, a work of art It really was what Steve Sarkeesian did. So you watch those games and there's a number of reasons why, right? But sometimes teams just come out and you're like, man, these teams, Dwayne Haskins could do no wrong against Michigan. It was like everything he did was like, holy cow, like that was well defended, but he put it like pinpoint right on this shoulder. It was just, it was unbelievable. So sometimes, especially a quarterback, like you said, Joe Burrow, he shows up and all of a sudden he's on good luck. I don't, I don't, I don't care what you do, right? We we're watching the NFL. When Joe Burrow's on, it's like, I don't, what do you want him to do? The Chiefs couldn't do it. Nobody could do anything. Good stuff from uh, Zach Smith. Follow him on Twitter, Coach Zach Smith, and obviously Menace to Sports. They post every day. Really good podcast. Uh, group of five, Power Five. We saw the first Group of Five team make it to a college football playoff. They played a respectable game. They didn't get annihilated, embarrassed, but pretty much from the first series, you're thinking, okay, Alabama's going to kind of, kind of sleepwalk. And just mm-hmm. this is going to look respectable on the scoreboard, like not embarrassing, but eh, 27 to six Alabama never in doubt. Certainly the worst power fives, Kansas, Rutgers, whoever you want to fill in the blank over time are not nearly as good as the top of the line, Houston, UCF, Cincinnati, and the, the group of five. But there's this, there's just this odd <laughs> odd yeah. balance to college football that doesn't yeah. exist in any other sports where you get the power five, you get the group of five, you go through the results, the power five wins like 85% of the games. There's a definite distinction, but there's an overlap at the same time. And to try to judge and evaluate these teams toward a playoff is nearly impossible. Yeah, it is. And and it really comes down to recruiting at the end of the day and, and not only recruiting, but recruiting big guys, right? It's always offensive line and defensive line oriented. You can find a back. Like I, I look back at my career, I coached at Marshall and Temple, both group of five schools, two of the better players I ever coached at receiver were in those spots. And Aaron Dobson was a second round pick for the Patriots. Um, and Rod Streeter had a long career with the Raiders. I mean, I think he played seven years at Temple. So they were really good. But it's it's there's there's ways to find those kids, those skill kids that maybe, you know, they're projects or whatever. And one of them, Robbie Anderson, I recruited at Temple. He's a great player, still playing in the NFL. So you can find skill kids. The issue those schools have with competing with, you know, the mid to upper echelon of college football is the offensive line, defensive tackles, and then depth. That's what it is. I mean, you, you, we, I'll never forget. We played Buffalo Taylor Decker's first start ever. He's like, all right, I'm gonna get my feet wet with Buffalo. He had to face Khalil Mack. Like, what are we talking about? So you can find those athletes, right? Khalil Mack broke his leg, South Florida kid, really good athlete. Who knew that when he'd come back from a broken leg, he put on weight and he'd become what he is today, right? You can find those kids, but to find five offensive linemen and even further than that, two might get hurt. You need to find seven offensive linemen that can play well enough to play against you name a team, right? Indiana even, or no, you know, anyone it's tough to do at that level just because that's, they're the rarities, right? A first round offensive lineman is rare, rare. And that's where places like central Michigan, Wisconsin, they found success in finding like a bigger tight end, putting weight on him. All of a sudden his junior year, he's 290 pounds. He's playing tackle, right? But he's pretty good athlete. It's tough to do. That's the hardest thing to do at that level is have depth where you could have a great player. If he gets hurt, I know if Aaron Dobson got hurt at Marshall, I don't know what I would have done. I, because my next guy going in wasn't wasn't half the player he was at Ohio State. Michael Thomas gets hurt. Noah Brown's not bad. 
he's going to be okay, right? Just look at this this receiver group that Ohio State had this past year. If Garrett Wilson were to get hurt, Marvin Harrison Jr. is going in, or or, or Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to slide out there, and they're going to bring in a Mecca Egg in the slot. Like, there's so many things they can do because they have so much more depth of that high level talent. I think that's the biggest thing in the disparity. Always great insight with uh, Zach Smith. Follow on Twitter at uh, Coach Zach Smith, Minister Sports Podcast, Monday through Friday. Zach, appreciate you stopping by. Always enjoy the conversation, man. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate you having me on, man. Really enjoy it.